subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates mr mutlingam was a board director of itc limited kolkata managing director of vst industries hyderabad head of personnel of bat industries london and president of the overall group of hotels delhi thereafter mr mutlingam set up his own consulting practice manas advisory focusing on top management psychological and leadership coaching he also serves as an independent director on several company boards education institutions and ngos uh, thank you mr udlinga for joining us for this webinar and i leave the floor to you uh, to share your thoughts on indo china relations thank you very much nijan and uh, thanks to speakin for this invitation to me uh, to interact with this distinguished audience welcome friends uh today uh i'm going to share some thoughts with you on india and china and their relations post covid now this is somewhat speculatory since india is still in the thick of covid whereas china has at least right now in its first phase uh come out of um, the rigors extreme rigors of covid at least for the time so what is it that we can look forward to in india china relations now as you know india china relations have been very complicated for many years there is the border dispute there are trade disputes there are many other issues and now on top of that there is covid people in india like many others all over the world are very upset and angry with china for what they believe china has done to the world in the form of bringing down this pandemic but at the same time governments around the world recognize that china is the world's second largest economy and post covid all countries will be hurt everybody will have to reconstruct their economies build shattered livelihoods and mend those families who have lost loved ones so how are we going to manage this dichotomy between the emotional effect of people feeling that china has done this and the economic effect of china being a huge economic power so i'm going to tackle this by looking at both these aspects psychology and economics you may think that psychology is somewhat peculiar in this aspect but not so if you go back to old thinkers many many uh, centuries ago our own cotillia the chinese thinkers the greek thinkers like aristotle and plato they found that leaders required instruction and they required to know about what they called state craft which is what we call foreign policy and international relations today rajneeti so to speak and for that you have to understand what they called human nature not only your own people but people of the surrounding regions who could be either friends or enemies now many many centuries later modern psychology has come a long way from that ancient study of human nature and has discovered some new facts and some new knowledge very different from freud and jung and lying on a couch and sharing your fantasies and this new knowledge is very important for us to understand when we look at covid how we deal with covid and the post covid world because essentially dealing with covid and post covid means making decisions under great stress so what happens when leaders as well as people have to make decisions under very stressful conditions 
So we will look at this and draw a few lessons from psychology and then move on to the economic aspect. Now, one of the great findings of modern psychology, and here I refer to the latest work in the last 20 years by both behavioral economists and psychological science uh, thinkers, people like Daniel Kahneman, Richard, Richard Thaler, both Nobel Prize laureates, and they've written popular books, which I would recommend. What they find is that human beings are not rational animals, as was thought. In fact, economic theory talked of homo economicus, the rational man, who makes all choices by weighing pluses and minuses. Rather, they found that people, and here all of us, and it's nothing unusual. All of us are a collection of certain habits and biases. And our thinking is not logical and rational all the time, like a computer. But equally, this rationality is also not completely without any system. It's like a weighing machine where you know what the error is. Suppose there's a two kilo error in measuring your weight. You can still use the same machine if you know what the problem is. So if we know our own biases and the ways that our thinking diverges, then we can take steps to correct. So what are these biases and habits of thinking that human beings have, which we should take note of. Let's remember that human beings evolved through millions of years. So these habits and biases were useful when they first entered our systems hundreds of thousands of years ago. They helped in human survival and in evolution, and that's why they're there. So I'll give you a few examples of what these patterns are. For example, there's something called recency bias. Something you heard this morning or this afternoon or yesterday, news or information, makes much greater impact on you than something you heard last week or last month. This was clearly useful to the ancient cavemen. If you said, oh, I saw a tiger in the jungle this morning. Well, you take note. But you say, I saw a tiger last month. Well, that's not a choice. So there is something called recency bias, where you pay more attention to what's happened just now. And in a modern world of WhatsApp and electronic media, this has become very, very important. Then human beings are comparative animals. We're constantly comparing. And in that business of comparing, we can sometimes either overvalue something or undervalue something. As an example, let's say you've been looking at a Mercedes showroom and then you look at a Honda showroom. Honda will seem quite cheap to you. But if you've been looking at a Maruti Alto showroom, the Honda will be expensive. To you. And this is something that store owners use when they give you bargains like buy three and get one free or buy a dozen and we'll give you a subscription to this magazine. They know that by these comparisons, they can trick you into a kind of illusion where you actually buy more than you need. One of the most interesting biases that we humans have is what you might have experienced, all of us have, called loss aversion. Now, loss aversion simply means that the pleasure we get in winning 100 rupees is much less than the unhappiness we feel in losing 100 rupees. Any of you who have been in the stock market or in, indeed played Diwali cards will know that even losing out of winnings is quite painful. We just don't like to lose even from our gains. And this also has got clear 
evolutionary value. But on the other hand, we are quite willing to postpone gains. Now, if I tell you, solve this puzzle and I'll give you one bar of chocolate. But if you wait for half an hour, I'll give you two bars of chocolate. Well, you'll happily wait, won't you? The only people who won't are little children under three. They'll just grab the chocolate. They don't want to wait. But others will. This is called postponement of reward or enhancement of reward. But it doesn't work the, quite the same way for loss. If your broker tells you, sir, please sell these shares because you're going to lose five lakhs. If you don't, next week, you would have lost 20 lakhs. Well, experiment shows that some people do follow this advice, but a lot of people phone their friends, check back and say, well, it can't happen. And they sit back until a bigger loss strikes. Now, these things, loss aversion, gain postponement, and uh, the question that you don't want to suffer immediate loss, even if a greater loss might be looming, these are facts well known to statesmen or politicians. Remember the old teaching of human nature and know your people. So leaders all over the world know this very well. We have to also be conscious about it. Now, if you think of all these biases or patterns of behavior that we all have, um, we can add to this our own memories. How do our memories work? Memory is not a photograph in the mind. It's not. Each time you remember something, you remember it slightly different. Each time it's been altered. Experiment has shown something very interesting that you remember an event by the way it concludes. So if you see a happy movie, but right at the end there's a twist and it's a tragedy, it gets classified as a sad film in your brain. And the other way about it. So if somebody's had a very happy marriage, but a bitter divorce, they remember it so badly. Oh, this was not a good deal. But if you went through a long 20-year court case and suffered badly, but at the end, you won out and got all your money back, you remember it as a good event. This is also evolutionarily very useful to a survivor. Now, enough about biases. I've covered all this because it is important to understand that when one is under stress, and remember, talking about COVID, post-COVID, we are all under stress. One of the experimental findings is when you are under stress, all these biases that I've talked about, all of them actually increase. The, the uh, possibility of irrationality under stress increases, so we have to be conscious about it. And there are two types of stress. There is known stress and there is unknown stress. Known stress is something like a war. We don't like wars, but history has taught us a lot. So we have a general idea. We know who is the enemy, where is the enemy, and so on. And we have some control over what to do. If there is a war, for example, with Pakistan, we know that if we are living in Amritsar, we are much more at risk than if we are living in Kanyakumari. That much control we have. We can move from Amritsar to Kanyakumari. But with COVID, we don't have that. This is an unknown stress. We don't know where it will hit, who it will strike, when and where. But the stress level is that much more. And this leads to loss of control 
people feel a loss of control and when you have loss of control you want to get that control back and therefore these biases and habits of thinking come to the forefront now let me give you two examples in human history where we have tackled human beings have tackled extreme stress under one situation humans responded to that extreme stress irrational as this model would be but in the second example human beings responded to that stress quite rationally now here are the two examples the first one is world war 1 1914-18 four years 10 million people dead a war to end all wars this was the way it was described when it finished after it finished president woodrow wilson of the united states at that time was instrumental in crafting the so called 14 points for the peace to be signed between the victorious powers and germany the losing power and wilson wanted a a fair peace which would not victimize germany but the european countries who were the victors france belgium england said no you know the germans started the war we can't let them get away with it so they have to be punished so they said our people are very upset they've suffered a lot of tragedy the germans started the war we will punish them and so at the treaty of versailles in 1919 very very harsh conditions were imposed on the germans sanctions trade limitations huge reparations they had to pay and many many humiliating conditions john maynard keynes lord keynes who was making his uh, uh, reputation at that time wrote a book and while he was writing this book he pleaded with the negotiators at versailles he said don't do this germany's economy will be shattered and that will in turn shatter european economy don't do it they didn't listen the consequences are well known to us the great depression started in the late 20s of course it was not only this factor there were other factors also but this was a major cause then the humiliation and anger of the german people led to the rise of the nazi party adolf hitler we know the story how it ends with the second world so here is an example of a very highly stressful event where the human reaction was more focused on relieving their emotions and seeking some kind of revenge might be as a result they landed in even greater difficulty but if we look at the second world war we see a different example now this war even bigger 50 million people died atom bombs were dropped there was huge civilian casualty because of air raids many more countries were involved the much deeper greater crisis it lasted longer 6 years But after the second world war what happened was very interesting the there was no versailles treaty or similar conditions uh the allied powers who were the victorious people did seek some justice in fact you might even call it revenge but it was not on the german people or the defeated people it was on the leaders of the nazi party and indeed the german people themselves went further of their own accord not that the allies had asked them to but they themselves offer an apology to the jewish people for the atroc- atrocities inflicted by the uh, nazi regime 
Secondly, the allied powers led by the United States started the reconstruction of uh, Europe and with the Marshall Plan and others, rebuilding the whole continent. A process of decolonization was started, a process of international institutions, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, to support the rebuilding of the uh, European and other economies was set in place. And people agree that the end of the Second World War started a period of about 50 years of growth and welfare in human society. Of course, some countries do faster and some countries do a little slower. But until the 1980s, say, or mid-80s, there was general increase in prosperity. Of course, this was not all because of the goodness of the heart of the victorious allies. There was one third factor in the Second World War, which was not there in the first. And that was, at the end of the Second World War, there was a common enemy, which was the common enemy of both the victorious powers and the defeated powers. Germany. And that common enemy was the Soviet Union. So in order to see that you unite against the common enemy, Allied powers also had this in their mind. They must not repeat what they did after World War I. So, let me summarize briefly before leading to the last section of my presentation. The summary is that stressful situations tend to evoke irrational behavior. But it is possible to build a common ground of rational action, even in stressful behavior, if you have a common enemy. Now, let me come to the third and concluding section of my presentation. And here I deal with India and China. Now I come to India and China in terms of their relationship. As I said, there is a complex history of relationships between the two countries. Uh, I've already highlighted some of the features. I won't repeat it. I think everybody knows it. But in terms of the economy, COVID is going to batter everybody. Indian growth is expected to be negative in the year 2021. Nobody knows the number, but people are talking between 8 to 10 percent. Chinese growth, we don't know. It may be zero, or it may be marginally up or down. World, the world economy is supposed to shrink by about 4 percent. So in that situation, um, Rebuilding oneself is going to be the top priority. Uh, it is going to be each country's major object to rebuild livelihoods, rebuild jobs, rebuild economies. And they have to do that not only by themselves, but through international trade and investment whilst fighting a common enemy. Who is that common enemy? There are in fact two common enemies. One, COVID will not go away in a hurry. So it remains a common enemy for some years to come. And the second common enemy, which has been looming uh, in the horizon for some time, but we have not paid too much attention to it, is climate change. And COVID has taught us a lesson that if we neglect something, that scientists have been telling us it will come upon us and create great damage. So COVID, pandemics and climate change are the common enemies of all countries and especially India and China because these are the two most populous countries in the world. 
they account for about 40% of human population and they are going to be seriously affected. So, we have to bear this in mind. But more specifically, talking of the economy, India needs trade with China. India imports more from China than China imports from us. We have a trade deficit. That simply means India needs Chinese goods more than China needs Indian goods. Now, this is not a good thing to have in the long run, but that's a different subject. We can cover it in the Q&A. But basically, there are a lot of things we need from China, including these telephones that we have, mobiles, medicines, electronics, so many other things. And there are things that we need from China by way of investment. China has got $3 billion, uh, sorry, $3 trillion of foreign reserves. These foreign reserves are invested largely in US Treasury bonds, which are yielding extremely small returns. In fact, people say that in the coming months, the returns are going to be negative. That means that China will pay, have to pay for the privilege of parking its money in US bonds. Now, they are not going to be happy about that. So they are looking for investments where they will get a return. So there are there is a two-way traffic that is possible and indeed can very much happen between China and India. China will also seek a large market that India has. Every market has turned much more risky. But India is certainly more stable, less risky, and is a large unified market compared to many of the markets in Central Asia or other parts of the world. China is dealing in through its Belt and Road Initiative. If I were in China, I would say, well, let's look at India more seriously because it is less risky than these many other parts of the world. So China too needs India, needs the market, needs returns. India needs trade, India needs investment if we are going to recover uh, and not only come back to our old system, but meet the objectives of building a new India as our Prime Minister has mentioned. So it is in economic terms, there is a rational case, very rational case to say, yes, we have all these problems of the past with China. We also have this feeling about COVID. But let us see what is the way we can handle it. What is the way we can deal with that without compounding the problem by denying ourselves the resources that China has and which can which can help us in our own journey going forward uh, through trade, through investment, through partnerships. Remember that although there is a lot of talk about decoupling from China, United States in particular, decoupling, shifting its factories, shifting uh, its companies out of China and other countries as well. That is not so easy. I think many of you uh, keep listening in are business people. And you know that it is extremely expensive to shift a factory from point A to point B. And uh, not only that, point B where you shift the factory must have the same efficiencies, the same lower costs, logistics, skills that that point A had. And that is not always easy to find. So these are all things which in theory are possible, but in practice take a long time to really happen. So there may be some decoupling, but I don't think it is going to be 
something very major, particularly because China today, at least in the first phase of COVID, has shown the fastest recovery of its economy and at least from the disease point of view, is probably a safer place to operate than many other parts of the world. Now, that may change in future, but at least at this time, that remains the situation. So, let me now um, come to my final conclusion, and then we can take questions and answers. Uh, the conclusion is that the examples I gave you about psychology, about World War I and World War II, show that under very stressful situations, human beings have a great possibility of making decisions that are not entirely rational. But it is also possible for human beings to take a decision to cooperate and coexist. And particularly when there is an even greater th threat, a common enemy that they have to face in the future. And therefore, my own prediction is, and I'm encouraged in that prediction by the uh, approach that our government has taken so far. Our government has noted that people in India have very strong feelings about China. But our government has been quite careful in its response. They have not joined in the slanging match that the US and China are having. They have not joined in the debate about the WHO and what is happening. They have been quite measured and careful in their reactions because they are quite aware of the economic implications. And therefore, I think that India will be able to navigate a logical and rational position to get through this tremendous crisis. Thank you very much for listening. I now welcome questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Uthlingo. Uh, for, you know, uh, some questions which have come up. Uh, uh, First, uh, people don't know your opinions on the U.S.-China uh, relations currently. Is this uh, something in the face of COVID and they may resolve it post-COVID phase or is the U.S.-China uh, relations likely to be tensed after this also? So what's your thoughts on this? Well, the, uh, under the current uh, presidency, of course, the relationship has deteriorated very sharply, um, both politically and uh, in terms of uh, uh, just even diplomatic niceties being thrown to the winds. But I think there is a point at which economic uh, realism will begin to dawn. Even today, a lot of the medical equipment, medical supplies is coming from China all over the world, including to the US. Um, a lot of essential medicines are manufactured in China. China is a big exporter of drug intermediates. Chinese economy is the second largest. It is the first to recover from COVID. So you cannot just dismiss China and say, no, I will not have anything to do. So my own view is that this at the moment is, is accelerated not only because of COVID, but because of the proximity of the US elections, which are just a few months away. But after that, the tempo may be slightly more moderated. There will be some decoupling. There will be some amount of pushback. And I think that is important because China also has overstretched itself and overreached itself uh, in certain areas. And it has to take note of that. The China must also be conscious of the world reaction. 
So uh, I think this kind of outburst is useful in the longer run. But over the longer run, I think economic rationality will prevail. Most of our viewers, I believe, are business people. Now, will you, for example, move your business or suffer losses just because of political reasons? You may, but then you will ask the government, look, do something. I'm hurting here. Give me subsidies or give me relief. But nobody would like to move their business from a situation of profit that is going to be affected badly with COVID. So they'll make very little profit. From there, if you say no, now decouple or do something else, they will be badly hurt. On the other hand, decoupling does not mean that you produce the same goods at double the price. That I think our prime minister made clear. He said, look, we want Indian brands to be world brands. We don't want Indian brands uh, to be something which is like the old form of socialistic society we had 50 years ago, where the prices were very high, which, which hurt our own people. So I think there will be a correction in time. Thank you. Uh, another question is by Amar. Uh, he's asking, what is China likely to do to show that they are not economically aggressive and will cooperate with other countries rather than try to undermine, undermine them? This is especially relevant in the wake of scuffles at LOC near Bhutan, chicken smack. Well, uh, let's remember that China is hurting very badly as well. China is not, although it has recovered, what does the recovery mean? As I said, the growth rate, growth rate at best will be zero, maybe 1%. Um, it may well be negative. It is hurting very badly. It has suffered a big reputational loss um, with COVID and the world reaction. Um, so it is not as if China is everybody's favorite today. So as I said, China will also have to take note of this situation because let's remember the Chinese economy relies a lot on exports, much more than the Indian economy. So the there is a limit to which the domestic economy can help China. If they don't get their export economy up, they are going to suffer badly. The export is a much larger proportion of this. Now, exports are not going to be easy for them because the world economy is going to be negative. Now, under those circumstances, if they become more aggressive, more unfriendly, do all manner of rash things. Is it going to add to their business? No. And I think, I don't think one should assume that they are highly irrational people. After all, they've done a pretty good job with their economy all these years. So they're not going to do something clearly against their interest. So I believe that these incidents and uh, will, in their own interest, they will temper it down. They need exports. As I said, their investments are fetching a zero return, may fetch a negative return in US Treasury bonds. They will want to invest elsewhere. Now, they start fighting with those countries. Those countries are not going to want those investments. So. Yeah. Uh, so a uh, few of uh, the students studying in China and studying the Chinese language have joined and they want to know uh, what trends do you see in jobs and where uh, uh, how it affects the jobs in the private and public corporate sector for those studying in China or learning Chinese language. Um, I think that um Chinese language will be extremely useful. So far, uh, I found that people with Chinese, Japanese, Korean, these languages 
I was snapped up in the uh, in the jungle. So I have I have no uh, hesitation in saying it's a very good language to learn. India and China are very big economies. The connection between India and China economically is only a fraction of its potential. Uh, so there is a very, very long way to go in business dealings, in economic dealings, in tourism, in all kinds of educational and other relationships, cultural going forward. So it is an excellent prospect. I would encourage them to learn. I would encourage them also to take some additional classes on internet and improve their speaking skills and their ability to communicate. Uh, we are coming on to this. So, um, yes, it's an excellent prospect. Do you see any particular industries uh, growing in China, uh, particularly which they can focus on? China is is a has become a leader in digital technology. Um, it is moving very very rapidly up the path. Um, they are uh, leaders in uh, digital payments. They are leaders in digital applications uh, on shopping, on payments, on mobile services. In fact. It is very difficult in China today to use a credit card. Everyone just has a phone with a QR code and you go there and you make your payments. Uh, they are now moving into 5G technology and using the 5G technology for all manner of things, telemedicine and so on. So the whole area of digital, digital future, including uh, digital currency, is going to be very big in China. Now, Indians have a background in software and uh, some 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 skills there. So, people who have those skills plus who have the language will have a very very good opportunity to enhance their interest. Remember, China has got about two hundred thousand foreigners working there. Uh, it's an international market now. All manner of people from all over the world work in China, uh, including, I think there are about 10 to 15,000 Indians working in China today in all, all the new sectors that have come. So it's a very good prospect, I would say. Okay. Uh Mr. Martin Jacks from London is asking, in what ways do you think China has overreacted in this situation? I think China has uh, succumbed to the temptation of a tit for tat kind of response. The response from the US, as I said, has been, uh, or, or the provocation from the US has been very undiplomatic in the kind of language they, they've used. But China could have been more restrained. And uh, the Chinese reaction uh, conveyed by some of its senior officials, and in fact, counter, counter explained by some other senior officials like their ambassador in America who tried to uh, pour some oil on the troubled waters. Chinese reaction has been similarly a little over the top. Now, at this point of time, it would have been helpful for China to say something like, look, uh, at the start of this epidemic, things did go wrong. It went wrong in Hubei province. People made mistakes. Uh, but we got back on it and uh, got control very quickly. But we will investigate and we will find out what went wrong. And if you can help us in this investigation, make it impartial, it will be helpful. I think if they had taken a stance like that, things might have been different. But once they took a stance, 
that know nothing uh, at all uh, was wrong. Although to their own people, they apologized for the the mess made in uh, in Wuhan uh, because people were very angry over it. But what happens is when a country is under attack, uh, that is a most difficult time for people to admit to any mistake. It happens with all countries. Every country and every people who feels they are being unfairly attacked or blamed, they react defensively. I gave you the example of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. And it happens with all countries. So I think this is where China might have misjudged uh, and uh, gone slightly wrong. The second thing is, I think they probably made too much about the medical aid they were giving other countries. Now, that was a very good move. They gave a lot of help to developing countries and other countries. But the moment you speak too much about it and say, please thank us publicly and so on, you then uh, take away something from that gesture. Uh, so I think there was some clumsiness in uh, these two situations where they have, uh, they have blotted their copybook. Thank you. Uh Amitav is asking, under current circumstances, how is the situation likely to improve our services market share? We do so many IT and other kinds of services for China. So how, what is the way to improve the services market share? Well, first thing is to get to know the Chinese market very well. And this is where earlier on I spoke about the importance of language. Uh, the main difficulty is a lot of Indian companies don't really understand the Chinese market very well. They have not invested enough time and research in understanding the Chinese market. It is as complex as the Indian market. It's a huge country like India. It has got many provinces like India. There are provincial differences. The structure of demand is different. Provincial laws are different. So it is important to develop some, uh, devote some resources, understanding the Chinese market, how it works, what people want, why they want it. And then we can develop uh, products for the Chinese market and we can develop services for the Chinese market. Now, some of our, our, our products are very popular. Um, yoga is very popular. In China, Yujia, they call it. Um, Indian food is becoming quite quite popular. Um, Indian generic medicines are much in demand, particularly cancer medicines, because they are not cheap in China, and Indian generics are cheap in China are are, are much cheaper than Chinese medicines for cancer. In fact, there was a film about two years ago, uh, popular film in China uh, titled uh, Dying to Survive. It was a story of a, of a uh, cancer uh, stricken uh, lady whose husband could not get the medicine in China because it was very really expensive. He went to India and got the generic and went back to China and he was arrested for smuggling. But then there was an outcry for, uh, in the Chinese media and uh, uh, his his conviction then his uh, conviction was uh, dethroned uh, uh, was reversed um, and that's a true life story so there are many products which india can market and sell in china but just like any other market you need to understand the market you need to understand the consumer you need to understand the psychology and human nature of the Chinese customer. So one question is, a lot of uh, Indian startups are being invested by investors from China, uh, Paytm or Ola and other such big basket. Do you see any trend changing in that 
more investment coming in or investment being uh, investment being lowered what what your thoughts on that as i said earlier india needs investment we are going to need huge investment uh from everywhere not just china everywhere but uh countries post covid are all going to be in varying degrees of economic difficulty and they are not going to have too much money to spare so we have to see who are the countries that have money to spare and have a need for a better return on their investment and one of those countries is china because they have as i said a large foreign exchange reserve which is earning a very very low return so it's in our interest to get chinese investment create indian jobs to create indian livelihoods of course there are certain strategic sectors which we should be careful about we should be careful not only with chinese investment in those sectors we should be careful with any foreign investment in those sectors so we should i our government should identify which are the areas where such investment is not welcome ideally that should be a small limited number of areas everything can't be strategic and in the rest we should encourage investment that is what is going to lead to jobs india has a huge population unemployment has surged because of the covid crisis we need employment at a much much higher rate than before so investment from anywhere in non strategic areas is most welcome thank you so much uh, for your time mr goodlingam today uh, it was a pleasure having you